Hello, and welcome to the CFA Society San Francisco podcast, where we interview and discuss current topics with leading members of the Bay Area investment community. This week, Tanya Subatang, Membership Manager with CFA Society San Francisco, sits down with Will Brokaw CFA, co-founder of Vesti Social, a social chat app for retail investors. Listen in as they discuss the cross-section between investing in social platforms, making the market accessible, and overcoming the challenges of being a young entrepreneur. Hi, Will. Welcome to our show. How are you today? Hi, Tanya. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. I am really excited about our conversation today. We're going to be talking about two subjects that ordinarily are not being discussed together. That is finance and social network. And who better yet to talk to about this than you, Mr. Brokaw, co-founder of Vesti Social. What I'll have you start our conversation by giving us a little bit of a background of yourself about your company, Vesti Social, and how you came up with that idea. Yeah. So Vesti Social is a social chat up for investing. And it's really, you can think of it as the social layer that sits on top of and connects to your existing brokerage account and crypto exchange. And at our heart, we are really a chat app. And we are inspired by the investment groups on Reddit and Discord. So you can kind of think of us as a Discord for stocks and crypto. We have public and private group chats and public forums for every stock and crypto. And all of this is integrated with your portfolio and stock information. So you can get updates when your friends trade and see uh, you know, what people are uh, buying on the entire platform. So it's really an enti- uh, you know, one-stop shop to chat, discover trending stocks, and execute all in one place. Where did the idea for Vesti Social came from? Yeah, so it's really been evolving for a long time. I've been a social investor for over 10 years. Um, I got my BA in economics and business at Colorado College. And my freshman year, I had the opportunity to join the CC Investment Club. And that was really when I first got my uh, opportunity to start investing. And that's when I really fell in love with investing and in particular, the social aspect of it. You know, I loved... Um, researching a stock or a sector, and then coming to my group and presenting and sharing those insights and then having that discourse with them. I think that's really what motivates me. And you know, I'm a social person. And so I really loved that. And that really stuck with me. And after college, I went on to work in investment management. I worked for two registered investment advisors, Baker Street and Clear Rock Capital in equity research. And during that time, I got my CFA. Um, but all along, I really kept up these investment groups on, uh, you know, with my friends from high school and college, and then just people that I met online uh, on, you know, on Discord with similar interests. And that really kind of motivated me to create Bestie Social. Um, I think, you know, the, the pandemic was really the turning point because that's when it felt like everyone started to invest. Um, and people were using other means um, to get investment insights and learn how to invest. You know, people were turning to chat apps and forums rather than uh, going to financial advisors. And that's really where we saw kind of a huge change in the landscape and, and the, a change in the market. Um, obviously, the retail investment space grew a ton during that time. Um, in the beginning of 2020, I think Robinhood had 10 million users. Now they have 22.5 million. Um, and so they've grown, you know, a, a crazy amount and, and, uh, Coinbase now has 68 million users and so worldwide. And so it really has become huge. Um, and people are on these forums, as I was saying, you know, Reddit's Wall Street bets, um, they started with 700,000, uh, members in the beginning of 2020. Now they have 11.3 members, um, 3 million members. Um, and so. This has really become um, a huge trend and something that's really permanent. I think you know it's it's not a transitory uh, thing because uh, even with the uh, you know everything starting to opening up and then closing again, unfortunately, but with the world kind of opening up again, people are continuing to uh, invest and they're still on these these forums. Stocks and crypto are still some of the most popular topics on Discord and Telegram. Um, Discord, I think, has 140 million monthly active users. Wow. And Telegram has 550 million monthly active users, and some of the to- uh, you know the most popular topics are stocks and crypto, um, and so that's really just cool to see, and that really inspired us um, to create Vesti. I think 
you know, we really love these apps, but we do see that they have their limitations because they're not designed for investors. Um, you know, when I'm a part of a group chat, it's hard to share portfolio information and it's hard to get timely updates when your friends invest. So, you know, we are regulated to taking screenshots of our portfolios and trades. Uh, when we're sharing with friends, that can be a lot of work when you're making five to 10 trades a day and you have to share them with your friends um, and your friends want to get those timely updates. One of my good friends was a, you know an earlier crypto investor, Gray, and he really got me interested in the market. And we are all waiting for Gray to invest uh, you know, and buy the dip or, and want to know. And so we've like we're making this app for for my friend group because we want an automated way to see when when he's investing and what he owns in his portfolio um and i think the the second real kind of issue that you see on some of these platforms especially the larger forums mm -hmm. where you don't know who you're talking to is right. uh a lot of the stock and portfolio information is unverified and can be misleading um and you this is evident with kind of the what you call pump and dump schemes where uh, people or bots are posting screenshots um, showing, you know, someone buying a, a bunch of shares of a stock um, to create artificial hype in the market. And then they sell it once naive investors have bought it. Um, and that happens very often. And so another thing that we are, um, you know, really problem that we're tackling here is creating verified information. And so you on Bestie, you link your uh, brokerage, you become a verified user, and um, you can share you know, your verified trades, your verified holdings. And as a follower, I can see, you know, so Tanya, if you're an investor, I can see that your track record of returns on a percentage basis, the trades you've made over time. Um, and this really adds another level of kind of security for, you know, a, a novice uh, investor who's just trying to start out and learn how to invest because I get to kind of see that full track record. And we amplify the best investors. So we have a uh, leaderboard so I can see, you know, who's done the best over certain periods of time. Um, so we're really trying to amplify the best investors and optimize your experience in your group chat. So you're definitely taking this kind of um, social networking into something that's very familiar, I think, for the younger generation, you know, like the leaderboard mm -hmm. concept um, and kind of the group chat. I want to kind of step back a little bit and ask, you know, because finance and investment is usually very traditionally more of a private mm -hmm. conversation, right? Like to your point, you you maybe have a couple of friends you talk about, like, I don't talk about this with my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know if it's a cultural up bringing or just the way that society has kind of been conditioned to. Do you think that finance and investment is ready for su such a social media transparency? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, I think um, we have, as, as a generation, we've become more social in kind of everything we do. Um, we've grown up in, you know, kind of the social media world. And so that really does impact us. But I, I've always believed that investing is kind of an inherently social activity um, because you are, you know, no matter no matter who you are, you're probably getting uh, some, an investment idea from someone else. If you're reading an article, or you're you're, look, you're you know watching the news um, or a research report, you know a lot of that is all coming from others. So I think it's really is a social activity, but. It's been there has been you know that stigmatism in the past. Uh, you know, I can compare my parents where you know there were maybe some smaller circles where people were talking about investments, but that was really a small segment of the population. And um, I think that really has changed. And what you know, in my mind, it's really it's really it's how we obtain information has changed um, because you know we do prefer. These social media outlets to kind of old, yeah, traditional, you know, watching CNBC. Um, and there are a lot of people that are still reading research reports, but um, a, a fair amount of us are, you know, looking to our peers and seeing what they're investing in and, and you know, and assuming that they're reading research reports as well. Um, a really interesting survey that was done by the Motley Fool, they found that. 91% of Gen Z and 75% of millennial investors got investing information in the last 30 days from social media. Um, and so that's, that really just shows that, you know, it's becoming more and more social for us. And we really do prefer, um, social media. I think the industry, you know, the impact of social media on the industry is really interesting. Um, I think, you know, even before a lot of these kind of social chat apps started to blow up, um, there were apps like Robinhood, the millennial focused brokerage apps that really made investing more accessible to, uh, you know, 
the non-investors. Um, and that was through, you know, having more you, uh, intuitive user interfaces, commission-free trading, you know, back in the eighties, I think it was uh, upwards of $70 to make a trade, um, in commissions. And so that really priced out a lot of people also fractional shares being able to buy, you know, a sliver of Amazon and Google, that would be thousands of dollars. You had to buy an entire share. Um, but now you can just buy a little piece of it. And that has really opened up the market. Um, I think a lot of you, you looking at the investment industry, um, a lot of these institutions that are not catering to kind of this new generation um, are going to really fall to the wayside. I think that is going to be something that they've got to keep up. It's incredible to see the growth of these companies that are, uh, you know, Weeble is, is another um, alternative to Robinhood and they sponsor the Brooklyn Nets now. And so I just saw that the other day and that was, that was cool to see. And Staples Center, the LA uh, arena is now going to be crypto.com center. And so you're just seeing it's, I mean, it's really cool to see um, the massive growth of these companies that are catering to these, you know, retail investors. Um, and I think the larger brokerages and kind of older institutions really do need to pivot. Um, and if they don't, that they're going to fall to the wayside. Um, so it sounds to me as though you're, you've created Vesti Social as a way to really make it um, accessible to a lot of the younger generation to invest. Because I know when I was in my early 20s, I knew nothing. I was just given the standard you know, put a certain amount of money out in your 401k and you're set for life, mm. you know? And so that's what I'm hearing is kind of what your goal is for Vesti Social. But, you know, your company is emerging during a meme stock phenomenon. We, you know, mm. we talked about GameStop um, and I think AMC is one of them where people will go into platforms like a Reddit or Discord mm. and can maybe inflate a, um, the cost mm. of a stock. What do you say to those that maybe do dubious of your company saying that it's no better than those kind of platforms and you're essentially going to be disrupting the market. Yeah. Um, and that's a great question. I think, you know, your point about being, you know, uh, starting out investing, you know, someone was like, oh, open up a 401k and that, you know, that's great advice that a lot of people aren't getting in general. And so we're just, you know, trying to create a community for those people as well. Even if you don't end up investing on your own, being able to, you know, talk to peers, and find out what, you know, which investment advisor you should use or robo advisor. Um, that's really useful information as well. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in terms of our differentiators from these platforms, I mean, we are, we do love Reddit and Discord and we're really inspired by them and the groups on these, um, have really inspired us. Um, I think, you know, as I said before, they're not designed for investing. So they do have that transparency issue, especially in the larger groups. And so that's one of our key differentiators. You know, we have the verified portfolios uploaded by real people. Um, and that does add, you know, that does help a lot because, you know, if you, if you're putting your money where your mouth is and you can, you know, you should, you're showing your portfolio, you're a verified user. Um, that there is another level of trust there that that is built. And I think that's really important because there are a lot of scams that are out online, of course. Um, I think, uh, you know, another differentiator is that we are trying to become a stock research app as well. So we are providing uh, fundamental data and price multiples. Um, and we really do want to kind of, you know, also be a finance app as well. Um, that said, you know, we aren't in the business of providing advice. And I think as, you know, as a company, we are kind of giving these guardrails, um, and trying to kind of build, build that up. But in the end, it's, you know, the users on our platform and it's the advice that they're giving and, you know, the investment ideas that they're sharing that, um, really is going to dictate what people invest in. And so. I think um, you know that is kind of a difference there. Like we aren't we aren't opposed to people. We're not going to not allow people to invest in uh, mean stocks on our platform. How do you think that having such a social you know network open up for those interested in investing? How do you think that it's going to change kind of the actual industry in the next ten years? What what do you mm. see for that? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's really accelerating what's already happening in the market. Um, and, you know, investing is becoming more democratized and uh, we're seeing more self-directed investors. I think that's going to happen more and more because we're social beings. And when we see our peers doing things, we probably want to do that 
as well. Um, and so I think that's going to be a real benefit. And then I think, you know, this is maybe not as much uh, a social component, but um, just the nature. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the great wealth transfer. It's kind of a buzz, buzzword that's talked about sometimes on like CNBC. And mm-hmm. um, over the next decade, they estimate, I think it's six, uh, $68 trillion um, is going to be passed from older generations to younger generations. And I think that's going to have a massive impact as well on the, on the industry. Um, because, um, the, you know, I think the, the dynamics of the markets are really going to change. And I think we're going to see a lot more ESG investing as well. Um, you know, I, I think from the, the social pressure alone, if, if I, um, you know, connect my portfolio and people can vet it on a percentage basis, then I'm probably going to be less likely to invest in, you know, what they call sin stocks and, and oil and gas. Um, and probably, you know, going to kind of change what I invest in. And I think that's going to be, uh, take, you know, have a big impact. I also think, uh, with more retail investors and less money in the hands of institutions, that is going to make, you know, probably going to, there's going to be more volatility, but money is going to move quicker, um, uh, across different industries. Uh, you know, it's a lot harder for a hedge fund or an institute, a large institution to change their investment mandate because they have to adhere to, you know, internal policies and all that bureaucracy. Um, as an individual, it's pretty easy to switch my entire portfolio. And so. I think that's going to, we're going to see a lot of change um, and a lot of quicker movement. I think, you know, um, the way we invest is going to change a lot faster than we might have expected. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that we're already seeing today is customers be, you know, of, of brands like Nike and, and, and Ford and AMC becoming investors themselves. And, and that's really cool. Um, and that's kind of changing the dynamic as well. Um, AMC now gives out free popcorn for people who have one or more shares. Um, and I don't know how many shares of Ford you need to own, but um, you get a discount on Ford cars if you're an investor as well. And that change is really cool because, you know, instead of these companies catering to kind of the larger institutions, they're catering to different stakeholders, you know, the investors who are also customers. Um, and I think that is kind of more of a decentralized way of um, existing. And I, I think that will be a real positive that we see as well. Um, and then I think, you know, another one that I really hope to see is as more and more people start to invest in the market and as as kids are, you know, seeing their friends participating in the market, I'm hoping that uh, more people will be interested in, you know, taking on a career in finance. Um, and I, I'm really, you know, I think investing has has always kind of been something for the wealthy. And mm-hmm. now with more people investing, I'm hoping that more people are going to want to um, you know, pursue a career in finance. And that's going to make the industry as a whole more diverse and fair. Um, so that's one thing that I'm really hopeful for. Wow, that's such a positive outlook. I really love that last part that you mentioned about, you know, it's kind of leveling the playing field and definitely inviting others who might not think, oh, I can do, do investment in finance because I might not have the background, but this is mm-hmm. kind of, you know, giving them the ability to make it um, approachable. I do want to kind of touch upon something that you mentioned earlier about kind of the group thing. You know, you're, you were saying that you had a friend and you were waiting to see how he performed in a certain portfolio. Do you think though, having such platform where you're waiting for someone to do something before you do it can kind of cause um, some people to not necessarily be more literate in finance. They're just going to sit back and wait. And it's going to, you know, for the lack of a better term, cause more people to be lazy when it comes mm-hmm. to managing their money and doing the opposite of what you're thinking. Yeah, I mean, that that's a good point. I mean, I think it's it's a step towards learning more than using a financial advisor. Uh, you know, that is kind of the ultimate way to invest and and not not look at it at all is, you know, use a betterment or a wealth front, um, even though those are those are great platforms. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think, you know, there is something to be said about, you know, just following what your peers are doing blindly. I don't think you should you should ever do that. Um, I would never advise that. But I think it's it's one of those things that I find super fun and exciting. And if you make, you know, if you follow your friend and, or, you know, you know, one of the top investors on platform and you make your first couple investments and hopefully those go well, that is really exciting. And that's probably going to get you more interested in the markets and how they work. And it's going to make you probably want to look at some other stocks, maybe look in some ETFs um, and other ways to invest as well. And so. 
it's, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a believer that some gamification and, and some of that kind of fun social aspect is actually a really great way to get our generation to invest um, because it, you know, there's a little bit of that competing. There's, you know, uh, and, and there's, it makes you want to learn more. You know, if, if you have a little bit of success, you kind of want to go research a little bit more and, and kind of dig in, like, how can I get better at this? Um, it's, it's a lot like, you know, kind of being a part of like a fantasy football group where, you know, you just get, you kind of get hooked, you get hooked in. Great analogy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I think, um, you know, there's definitely, you, you never want to just blindly um, follow, you know, especially a, a Rando's advice, but, <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think uh, overall it, it's, it's a good thing. Also in the answer you provided for, you talked about ESG and actually this would kind of help push those efforts forward. Why do you say that? Why do you say that ESG, you know, having such a social transparency with peers will help push ESG initiatives, you know, further along? Well, I think it's really that, you know, most of us have, you know, believe in climate change and, um, or, or, you know, that we want socially responsible companies, um, but it's it's very often that we don't actually like our portfolios don't actually match those beliefs, and um, it's you know it's a lot easier to hold um, to own you know stocks that might not be matching your beliefs when it's just kind of a, a private thing. But when you actually have that out there, and one thing I will be clear is that we never show dollar values on our platform, so it's only percentage. Um, so anyone can kind of talk you know regardless of your portfolio. Yeah, but when you um, share, you know, your portfolio, uh, that you have that social pressure, as I was saying, and I think that's going to, you know, make us want to make better investments um, and move us further along because it's it's kind of like when you put something on Instagram or you know any other platform, you have the world that's you know that's that's looking at it, and I think that's going to make us, you know, make more conscious, environmentally conscious investment decisions. They make this person more accountable like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to kind of take it back a little bit in the beginning because um, people can't see you right now, obviously, because it's a podcast, but you're a young man and you co-founded this career very really early on in your career. Um, and starting a company is never easy at any age. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear what are some challenges that you had faced as a young co-founder when you were trying to attract your angel investors and what have you done to help overcome those challenges? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, yeah. So, and to give you a little background, my co-founder Quinn Mitchell and I are both, I guess he's 28 and 27. Um, and so we had about five years of experience, work experience before, um, before starting Vesti. Um, but that was definitely, you know, our, our age, and you know, I guess our experience were those were kind of roadblocks we foresaw, you know, in our angel round um, back in April. And I think you know, you definitely have to prove more with a prototype and a proof of concept um, than you would if you were uh, a very successful founder that you know has built a successful business. You can kind of just come to investors with an idea, and boom, they give you money. Although that's happening more and more <laughs> this day, uh, but. You really do have to prove a lot more, and so that was, you know, something that uh, we definitely, I guess, you know, had to overcome a little bit more in that investment. You know, obviously having, you know, career in finance and the CFA, those were uh, really beneficial as well, because we know our target market. I think, you know, overall, our age is actually a huge competitive advantage because we really are our target market. Uh, you know, the our, the three founders were all social investors. And we really understand, you know, the needs of retail investors. Um, it's it's really great having a bunch of peers who invest because we can we have an immediate feedback group. You know, I can send groups like, "What are your thoughts on this? You know, what issues are you facing here?" and have them right get right back to you. So I think there's some realities where, yeah, obviously you kind of face some extra challenge. You have to prove yourself a little bit more, but in the end, we know that you know we we know our target market more than anyone else, and so I think that's a that's a huge benefit. And I will add that we we added uh, Michael Hybe after our angel round, and he has ten years of experience um, in engineering for fintechs. He also like, architected the Vanguard's retail trading platform, and so he really filled you know kind of that that void. Um, and we're we're hopeful that that will that will help us for this next round as well. Kind of round out your group there. Yeah. Much. What advice would you give somebody that say who is young because you mm -hmm. just said you're tw you're 27 i mean mm -hmm. god i don't even know what i was thinking when i was 27 
<laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, who, who might be in the same shoes as you, maybe they're just starting out in college and like, I already know what I want to do, but to your point, being young and inexperienced in a specific career might kind of deter them. What advice mm -hmm. would you give somebody who eventually wants to be where you are today? Yeah, I, I would go for it. I think like I, in college and, you know, first couple of years after I always thought, oh, I'd love to start a business down the road. And, but I need to get all this experience. Like there's no way I'd start a business now. Um, and I think when you know, you, I feel like you kind of know. Um, when, when you really start to understand, you know, the problems that uh, your target user has um, and solutions to those, that's when then that's when you should you should really go and tackle um, and create a business. I think because that I guess that would be my advice. It's it's one of those things that you can kind of push off, and it's like, oh, well, it's going to be easier mm -hmm. if I have ten years of experience. But you know, life changes too, and and that's that's kind of the reality. And uh, you know, maybe down the road you'll have kids, and um, you know, th things will change, and it'll actually be much harder to start a business. Um, so you just never really know. And so I guess you know, if that's a passion that you have, and then you come up, if you have that aha moment. I would go for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you you mentioned earlier obtaining your CFH helped you. What else would you say helped contributed to, you know, proving your commitment to your company? Were there any mm -hmm. other factors that kind of help, you know, your angel investors going, "Oh, yep, yeah, okay, they're they're reliable, they know what they're doing even though they're they're very young or, you know, don't mm -hmm. have the career experience." Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the the CFA is the good like shows that you can grind um and doing that it, it your schoolwork and you know if you're in, in a job um doing that as well i think you know always putting in the hard work i guess one thing is like if you if you have a passion just pursue that you know on the side and so you know for me like loving being a part of investment groups you never really know what it's going to turn into um never expect it to turn into anything you know it's just like something you're you're kind of doing um you continue to do and then maybe one day like everyone's going to want to start doing that you know <laughs> and so i guess that's i think the best thing you can do is kind of you know pursue what you love and hopefully down the road you know that will kind of prove to be really valuable because i think one thing that early founders in particular probably really struggle with is you know, oh, how long have you, you know, really been doing this? Is this just like a little phase that you're just trying to pursue and then you're going to, you know, go start another career? Um, so like the more kind of time you can put in and, you know, the more years of kind of experience and, you know, you can show that that's really going to help. Um, and it can start in high school it can start, you know, in middle school. That's that's a good point. It, there's no such mm -hmm. age that it says, aha, you have to do this. Yeah. That's, a, that's a really good point. So what's next for you? What's next for Vesti Social? What can we look forward to seeing in the future? Yeah. So, well, we're, we're still relatively early on. We have um, an alpha in test flight and we are launching our private beta um, the beginning of February. Um, so we are, yeah, I guess about a month out. And wow. yeah, so that that's really exciting. This starting in January, we are uh, trying to raise a seed round. And so that'll be, uh, you know, a big endeavor. Uh, and then hopefully by the end of Q1 2022, we'll be launching on the Apple App Store. So that's kind of our immediate uh, roadmap. And expanding from there, we're hoping to hire uh, three more developers. So we'll have a full team six and um, really, really taking this business off. That's the goal. What do you envision Vessi Social to be? I know we talked about you know the social platform, but do you hope it to be something else in the future or expand to it? Or are you kind of happy just to kind of where you are and um, you know building building it as is? Yeah, I think I mean, it's a great question because there's so many. We've talked about this as a team. There's so many different ways you could go. And I think right now we're really just trying to fix these problems that we see. And uh, starting with, you know, that's why we're starting with the chat because um, that's what we see people doing in the market. People love chatting and they they really love these chat apps. And so that's where we're focusing our attention and really optimizing your experience as a group. And I think from you know we we really want to be we want to have APIs with with all brokerages, all crypto exchanges and wallets. And so you can really share anything, you know, any any different type of portfolio you can share on Vesti um, and really kind of be that that social layer that I was talking about. That's really the goal. You know, we've talked about 
different ways to invest. Um, and but I think w- what we've all what we all kind of believe is that these kind of conglomerate apps out there where they're trying to do so many different things. If you go on like Venmo, it, I talk about this with my friends, but you know we love Venmo, and now Venmo feels like it has like five different apps in one app because there's like a credit card and there's like crypto and there's all these different things. And the, I think the more one of the issues that a lot of these larger corporations face is that they are trying to do too many things and it kind of ruins the entire experience of one app. And so I think we're all kind of, um, you know, of the belief that we need to really tackle this issue and build the best experience for uh, investors. And, you know, that's, you know, crypto investors and stock investors. And then also, you know, maybe only being able to connect and share NFTs and stuff like that. But really, really focusing on investors. Um, and then we'll take it from there. But that's that's kind of my take. Well, that's awesome. And I look forward to seeing what will become Investy Social in the next year or so. But before I let you go, I have to ask, because I asked this to everybody I interview, who inspires you and why? It's a great question. Yeah, I think, you know, both of my parents and also my, my two older sisters, they're all educators. Um, and I've, you know, I've kind of taken a different path in life, but I, I love educating people as well. And um, it's actually, you know, one of the reasons I started Vestie is because I really loved more than ever, you know, having, you know, helping my, my, my sisters, my family, um, and my, my close friends invest for the first time. I think that's a really cool thing to do because there's so much learning that happens, that happens there. Um, and so that is really, you know, one of the big reasons I'm, Working on Vesti is because um, I want to improve financial literacy, and I think there's a lot of opportunities in education to, to help um, society. But yeah, I guess my my parents and my sisters. <laughs> what a great answer! I haven't heard that one yet, so that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for joining me this afternoon. I had a great time talking with you. I hope you did too. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a all pleasure. Right. Thank you for listening to this episode of the CFA Society San Francisco podcast. We hope you enjoyed the engaging discussion. Please stay tuned for more episodes of this podcast featured every fourth Tuesday in our weekly newsletters and through the CFA Society San Francisco podcast channel available through most major podcast apps.